So at the end of last week, we were talking about angels. The term um, simply means messenger. Um, and in Hebrew, certainly, um, a malach, uh, melachim was, um, was um, a messenger of anybody. So a king could send a messenger. Um, but obviously, the context here is messenger of God. Greek angelos, that's how we get angel. Um, in many ways, I was saying before, um, an angel is God in the same way that a human emissary represents, uh, even today, that government, right? So, you know, U.S. ambassador in a country or the French ambassador, for example, uh, right? A couple of weeks ago when we um, uh, took their contract out from underneath them with Australia for submarines, France expressed their dissatisfaction by withdrawing their ambassador. Uh, that ambassador represents the country as a whole. So when um, when an angel, a messenger from God would come, the messenger um, represents God. And the narrative, when you're looking in places like Genesis and Exodus, for example, the narrative will also often begin by saying the angel of the Lord appeared or the angel of the Lord said. And then as you go through the dialogue, it's just the Lord said to Abraham, the Lord said to Moses. Now, that brings up some questions. Um, there are some people who, uh, some Christians who will view these as theophanies because any physical appearance of God they um, understand as, as must be Jesus. Uh, and so they see them as Christophanies that um, um, Melchizedek, who we'll talk about there. I've heard more than one sermon uh, on Melchizedek in Genesis uh, as a Christophany, an appearance of Jesus before or the Christ before um, Jesus is born. Um, I, I don't think that's the case in those circumstances, certainly. It is unclear, though, in other pas <clears throat> passages, like, you know, the three angels appear to um, Abraham and tell him that he's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And then one angel walks off with Abraham, and they're overlooking um, the valley and the cities, and in the, the dialogue shifts that it's the Lord speaking to Abraham. Is that God or is that this angel, a messenger? The point is, it's not clear, right? It, it, there's an ambiguity. And I, I emphasize that because that's the same sort of ambiguity in the first century that people would have been trying to figure out, okay, we believe Jesus was something amazing sent from God, but where does he fit into all of this? And even the phrase son of God um, would fit into this metaphor, or, or this, uh, not metaphor, into this um, um, schema, if you will, because B'nai Elohim, or sons of God, um, is a term we find uh, for figures that are sometimes translated as angels, messengers from God. Sometimes you'll just have the phrase Elohim used, as we'll see in the Psalms. Um, so Psalm 8, this will be the end of our passage today, or actually it's the beginning of the passage, we'll start next week. What are human beings that you are mindful of them, yet you have made them a little lower than Elohim, is what it says. It says God in the New Revised Standard Version, uh, but others, uh, and the Septuagint, uh, the Targum, the Aramaic Version. So other ancient versions, instead of representing Hebrew Elohim <clears throat> with Theos for God in Greek, or Elohe in, in Aramaic, will um, the, the Septuagint and the Targum render it with angels? Um, so this question of what's going on with Jesus is, is relevant and, and understandable. Um, and this is where our uh, author begins with who or what was Jesus? So any thoughts on angels? Well, my favorite vision of them is the verse where they says they're going up the steps and down the steps or on a ladder. Yeah, Jacob's something. <laughs> Hebrew is yeah. confused. Yes. And, um, but, you know, I think of angels nowadays as someone who brings kindness and it's coming to me, it's coming from their heart from God. So I think we still see angels all the time. Yeah. I think the notion of angels as supernatural beings 
um, is, is very challenging to most modern Western thinkers, folks. There is a, a very broad sense uh, and that, that those who are ministering for and on behalf of God could be viewed as angels. Um, there is no doubt that both the author of Hebrews and frankly every other author of every other text in the, in the Bible understood these supernatural beings to be real. And like I said, I think this is a bit of a challenge for us. I think concepts that are that we will come up against time and time again here in Hebrews, um, the notion of a day of judgment, that there is a heaven and a hell, and that there is judgment, and that there is something to be saved from, um, the, the, that there are these supernatural powers, both, both good and evil. Um, these are they're, they're not explained in the Bible because they're assumed. They're a part of the, the fabric of reality. And for me personally, I don't have enough data to reject that. I know that plenty of people are very uncomfortable, plenty of moderns, and they, their, their logic um, leads them to want to um, say that such things don't exist. But I, if I'm believing in a God who can... Uh, become uh, human and, and flesh and rise from the dead and raise others from the dead and do miracles, uh, why am I drawing a line at that? Um, there is a reality beyond that which we perceive solely through, through our experience and our ken. And there, there is, I think I've preached in Good Shepherd once or twice on this, the, the concept of mystery. And that we just simply have lost sight of it, I think, in most of the Western traditions. And when I talk about the mystery and the mystery of God and, and the mystery within our faith, and we have that phrase in the Book of Common Prayer all the time, uh, what we might forget is that it, it comes from the Greek notion, the, the, the notion of something that is revealed. And it's revealed because there's no other way that we can discern it. And... Um, unless you have received a vision uh, of an angel, then how you have to go on faith of others' testimony and of other accounts. Um, but there is so much about our faith that we only know through revelation. It's, it is a mystery. So it's, I just feel like we needed to uh, foreground it, just be honest, or I need to be honest anyway, with, uh, with both myself and, and us as a class that we've got to Maybe we shelve some of these things for a time, but for this author, for this community, there was no question. In fact, the only question is, angels are real. So who is Jesus? Is he an angel? And if he's the son of God, what does that mean? Any other thoughts or comments? Hey, I guess I'm, I'm a little more in terms of realism on, on this. And I, I have to say, I really don't know what to make out of a lot of it. Uh, I, that article I sent you on the preaching uh, helps. Uh, he talks about humans being in the image of God uh, or reflecting the image of God. And I, I, guess, I guess I would put uh, the, the angels in that sort of category. Uh, some, some, someone you can see and hear and touch and, and, uh, and yet see God in them. And, and I certainly wouldn't, well, two things. One is, Mac, I, I, I hope everyone knows I'm not, um, there's no test here. There's nothing, uh, nothing to pass in order to, uh, to, to remain in the class or anything else. We, we will have different views on lots of different things. Um, I would probably go to a both and um, the supernatural. Yeah, it's just it's a, it's a hard thing. And um, but it is something that's a part of their reality. So I think on, certainly in, interpretively, which is maybe different than homiletically, if we were to preach it, I think there's a certain amount of, of at least understanding. Like when I approach a rabbinic text, obviously, there's so much of rabbinic theology that I don't agree with. But I have to put myself into that mindset for me to fully understand and appreciate what's in that text before I go forward. But there's no, there's no doubt. I think it's a, I think it's a very healthy and helpful way for us to understand 
Um, in fact, I wrote a little something for the staff newsletter, uh, obviously with non-religious language about the light that we each bring to one another, even as the day's uh, daylight shortens and the time can be challenging. Um, in this group, I would say that, you know, we each are in that sense, truly messengers uh, from God, for sure. So our author, we have this preamble we talked about last time about God, that, that the idea that the son is, um, is speaking, uh, is God speaking to us. There were prophets and now there are sons. I think it really sort of echoes that parable of Jesus, um, as well as John 1. Um, but then verse 4, um, so verse 3, we get this, this summary of exactly what he's doing. I mean, the, all of verse, verses 1 through 4, I think, are in some ways kind of a creedal statement. Uh, but verse 4, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. So here are the next few verses. And um, this is basically where we'll spend today. And... Um, you can see, I've gone ahead and highlighted all of the, the, the quotations uh, in blue. And you can see the vast majority of these verses, what is this, five through 19, nine verses, 14. Um, the vast majority is just uh, quoting other texts. Stylistically talked about how this is uh, very much in keeping with a kind of homily where you quote all your scripture up front and then you're going to exposit it, that you're going to... Um, preach on it effectively as you go make your way through, or on the other hand, uh, bolstering it. There is a little bit of proof texting. You know, if, if you're familiar with that phrase, it, it can be a pejorative phrase to say that pulling a, a passage out of context um, to, uh, to apply. Um, and so, but this is, this is part of why for me, um, I think, there's little doubt that the audience is either Jewish themselves or um, a congregate, I mean, probably a mixed congregation, I should say first. That, I would say that's a certainty. But the majority either being uh, Jewish themselves or deeply steeped. And we should remember as well that in, in the, at the turn of the era into the first century, there were many Jewish congregations um, around the Mediterranean that had a lot of Gentiles uh, attending. Judaism had become a very intriguing um, religion for many in the Roman Empire. And so many people were studying and were there without committing necessarily. We found more women. And so that's how Christianity grows so quickly. You have so many converts from among these, what, what the New Testament calls God fears. So anyway, so it's a community that, that they care what the Bible says. So for which, to which of the angels, so this is demonstrating that Jesus is more than the angels. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. How does that make sense? Why do those two passages, why are they relevant to his argument? Well, let's start first with, with what is the original context of both of these? Anybody remember? Hang on, I got to get my... I have a New Testament sitting next to me. I need my, my full Bible. Got all my computer Bibles hooked up for you. <laughs> got to go old school paper. Max Psalm 2. New... And what, what do you all think? Do you all know these Psalms at all or, or the Chronicle reference? So Psalms is a little harder because it, we don't have a real context for it. So let's start with 2 Samuel. Anybody recall this? 2 Samuel 7 is, is, is about David, right? And so let's see here. What did I say? Two seven, uh, Second Samuel. So this is when David wants to build a, a temple. And Nathan initially says, sure, go right ahead, build a temple. That'll be great. Right here in Jerusalem, you know, there's, there's more or less peace now. This is good. This, whoopsie. 
this is a good it will be a good time to build a temple and um and then overnight god says to nathan not so fast and um who was a tv guy who would do that not so fast anyway um and what what david is what god says to david is you want to build me a house i'm going to build you a house that is a dynasty and it will then be your son uh verse 13 or verse 12 when hit when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your ancestors i will raise up your offspring after you who shall come forth from your body and i will establish his kingdom that's relevant to david because you recall saul didn't inherit his kingdom god put david there so so far we don't have a dynasty in israel he shall build a house for my name and i will establish the throne of his kingdom forever I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. Now, slightly problematic for certain, for some of the Christology. When he commits iniquity, I will punish him with a rod such as mortals use, and goes on, and that's obviously referring to Solomon and to other human descendants of David. But so this passage in 2 Samuel is a reference to, really, the son there is, in the immediate context, is Solomon, right? Does that make sense? You with me? Yeah. So, but there are a couple of things in that passage that caused Jews of the era to begin to reread all of this. Because verse 13, he says, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Well, they hadn't had a son of David on the throne since the sixth century, 586 BCE, when Jerusalem was destroyed. The Hasmonean, um, dynasty that was on the throne was neither of, of the lineage of David or of Aaron. So they weren't, um, they, they were neither um, appropriate to be king or to be high priests, according to scripture. So the psalm then, we think, is, um, let's see, yeah, um, is more of a um, coronation hymn, or it's a hymn. It's a hymn to the king. Um, by the way, if you are, um, yeah, okay. This, so it begins. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves. So it begins with a um, a concern, but um, then it goes on. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord has them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and ter terrify them in his fury, saying, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten of you. Begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. So these are statements about, if you if you took it, um, if you were reading these passages in their immediate context, they're about very human kings, right? So how does this work for our author's argument? Well, when I read that Samuel, I think it's referring to the genealogy that like um, Matthew starts with. One thing I noticed is that in Samuel, which this may be just my Bible, but the father and son are not capitalized. When you get to Hebrews, mm -hmm. they are. So yeah. to me, there's such a, you know, there's a lot of things that have happened between A and B. So to me, this is just the um, development of the genealogy and to me it fits well um, so I, I've you know I struggle sometimes um, Christian I actually went back and watched um, the first Sunday and I went down a rabbit hole for about two hours after watching it trying to better understand how Judaism actually got its 
stronghold in the, mm. the country. And gosh, I mean, there's, it's just, and I thought I should have just ask Christian for a, to send me just a five sentence description because that's all I need. But it's curious to me that, that um, religious scholars go line by line. And I, I just, I just like to accept God's mystery and have the faith that I'm okay that there was angels before the son and it is his son and I can understand the Trinity. You know, I, I always wonder when preachers get up and say, this is the most difficult thing to preach on. And I always think, you know, it's God coming three ways to surround you with his love so mm -hmm. well, I, I appreciate that and i i do um and not everybody comes with the same depth of faith i think that you have um i have known people who i think it's always much more complex but they have attributed their leaving christianity to the fact that they could not become reconciled to the notion of the Trinity. They could not become reconciled to the idea of Jesus being God. And for you, it, you're able to just roll with it, and, and that's fine. And I think that is something that we often need to keep in mind, that you know, when we read different letters of Paul, he's addressing different circumstances and objections that different people have at different places. I often think reading Acts, where is it? Um, uh, somewhere around 15, but that's the Jerusalem Council. But when, when Paul is, uh, was, is in the Agora and he, he turns around and he says, I see a statue to the unknown God. And then he starts talking. It, to me, it's a great example of the way in which Paul is using whatever opportunity, whatever uh, gap is there to, to talk about the gospel, to sort of translate it, if you will. But also, that statue to the unknown God was expressing a need and a yearning that that community had. And so this may not be where yours is, Anne, but other people, it may be. Um, you know, I listened to, um, I haven't, haven't had a chance to listen to Henry's sermon today, but I listened to his sermon last week about Gehenna. Um, won't, you know, go into deconstructing the whole thing, but, but the notion of hell, the notion of a day of judgment and condemnation is a real difficult uh, issue for many, many people. And yet it is present within the New Testament. Jesus speaks about hell more than anybody else. Um, and, you know, so so for some people, we really have to wrestle with other people. It just doesn't, it, that's not where their, their burden yeah. is. And right. so the, the author of Hebrews is addressing a different kind of audience. That's why I keep talking about what, what his audience would be and what may or may not be persuasive. This kind of seems similar to me to like the gospel writings where uh, Jesus turns to his disciples and says, in three days, I'm going to destroy this temple. Remember that. Uh, at the time that yeah. Jesus says that, they have no way to understand what he's talking about. And it wasn't until the historical events came to being and they could look back on his sayings that it was understandable. And I feel uh, the same way about these verses. You know, they're written in some kind of context, but it's after uh, Jesus uh, walked the earth, it was crucified and was raised again, uh, that they can just have a different meaning uh, in that particular context than they ever could have in their original. A question about Psalm. You know, it, sorry, go ahead, Kathy. No, no, you should respond to Amy. No, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, please. It's kind of not not really what she was talking about, so I hesitate. To well, let... I think Amy's comment stands on its own, lovely, beautifully. So please, Kathy. Okay. Um, about Psalm two, I don't know if um it's here because it's like an analogy for God's assuming God uh, decided to have Jesus come to earth and, and give him the kind of power that he would in an anointed king, then maybe it's just here for kind of an analogy, at least for a Christian. 
an, an analogy to, I mean, I'm sure that the people are, I mean, I'm sure they're wrestling with Judaism and some of their tradition, but also um, where to put the father in context with the son. Yeah. Um... I think there's, yeah, I think there, uh, Kathy, there are a bunch of things that are being wrestled with, right? Um, you know, there, uh, I think it was Anne who made the comment about her her Bible having capitalized or not capitalized, and, and those things are problematic because, of course, there are no uncle, no capital letters in, um, 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 in the Bible, in the biblical manuscripts. Um, it is interesting, though, because um, this language of referring to God as the Father, um, certainly in the what Jesus would have known as Scripture, what the what our author would have known as Scripture, these are the only places where God is clearly saying to the King of Israel. Let's put it in those terms where God is clearly saying to the king of Israel, you are my son. I'm going to treat you as my son. I am I'm adopting you. And as you go through 2 Samuel 7, you know, God is not only saying you're going to be my son, but that means I'm going to punish you if you don't do what's right, because I care that much about you. Because if I didn't care about you, you can just go off and do whatever, and I'm not going to pay attention. Um, there is no other references that we have in writing until you get to the New Testament and any Jewish text using this analogy um, of, of God as father to anyone. Wow. But we do have this phrase, the sons of God, B'nei Elohim, and then we've got that son of man, which actually does not, interestingly enough, son of man phrase is, you know, from Daniel 7 doesn't play into Hebrews at all, which is quite interesting. Uh, it is... All, uh, interesting often um, as a scholar to look at what's not <laughs> referenced as, as much as to what is referenced. So I think, uh, as I said, the, the author here is trying to clearly is a, by, we, we sometimes refer to this as reading backwards, reading into the text. By, by the author's argument, he's clearly responding to those who are trying to say that Jesus is just an angel. And part of his argument here and that we'll get to in, in, uh, from Psalm 8, that we'll get to a little bit later, but I've cited here, humans as a whole are, um, are, are, are made a little lower than the angels, and yet then we become elevated. Um, this cosmology, this vision of this world with all of these other beings and creatures is, is something that's never explicated fully, and yet clearly is somewhat complex. Um, and I, I, Kathy, I wasn't sure where you were going. You started to, I think it was Kathy or Anne, I can't remember, um, started making comment about scholars going line by line. Um, it was, yeah, I mean, it was we- me. It was me. Um, and I don't mean that negatively, Christian, but no. something that struck, you said, if I can believe that God put Jesus in Mary's tummy, as you know mm -hmm. baby and I, I, there's a point where i have to if i'm going to believe that then i gotta believe you know um but i yeah. am curious i mean going because i am curious about how scholars they do i mean you know i i got to really thinking about that this week so yeah i was going to say it is especially the kind of work i do we do often go line by line but the point is we then have to pull in and out. And that's what I was going to try. And, and we sometimes in, in a church faithful context will refer to this as an inductive Bible study sort of method. You start with just looking at that verse, what's there in our context. We also then have to kind of get even further behind, go find out where these verses being quoted come from. What are they in their context? What is it doing in this context? And that's part of what I was saying there is all of these passages mean one thing, to Amy's point, they mean one thing in their original context. They now take on a new and different meaning in their current context. And then in just this immediate context of chapter one, 
And then as we look in the, in the overall arc and argument of this document, it, it takes it on more fully. So, you know, scholars, it, scholars can be setting about to do all sorts of different things, but the kind of reading that I think, you know, you'll find in, in a, you know, in, in a good commentary, for example, is going to do that sort of layering work, right? Sort of start on a very granular and then pull back and then see how the whole thing works. I do think sometimes, I've been mulling on this a lot. Um, I think, I think there are times that that scholars and theologians we we uh, make mistakes going both directions. That is sometimes we can take one particular passage in word and just blow it out of proportion. I think that happens quite a lot. But I think we then also will sometimes completely ignore other bits. and and that I think is the real challenge is to bring to bring it in and and then on, on a third hand, if I may, is, you know, I trust that the canon is inspired, that God guided and led, but it's the language of humanity that's being used here. And there are many a time I have had, you know, an email that I sent to the faculty about something, or an article that I've written, and somebody comes back and says, well, you said this this way, and this means X, Y, and Z, and I'm like, Oh, I understand why you read it that way. That's not really what I meant. I should have phrased it differently. And there have been more than one time this week when I've been reading, we're, we're in Corinthians, I think, 1 Corinthians for, for our um, uh, daily prayer, daily office. And I've thought, if Paul could, could rephrase it, I wonder, I wonder if he would, you know? how often do we get caught on something that might have been just sort of a quick dashed off note? Um, anyway, Mac, were you going to say something? Uh, no. <laughs> oh, okay. I was, I was just sitting here thinking, I, I, I know now why uh, Revel our, um, Hebrews has, has always been a book I've uh, avoided uh, because it's dealing with the kind of world that I don't understand, and it's not mine, uh, my world. Hopefully, and, you'll get it, gain a better understanding. And, and I think uh, well, a lot of it comes out of the evangelical preaching that I heard growing up and just totally reject it. Mm. Well, and, I, and yeah, I mean, there are uh, golly, a number of great observations you make within that, Mac. I mean, the, starting with the latter, because, you know, my background, too, uh, very similar, but is is the work I know that we've both done, which is to go back and say, okay, what what is the, um, I heard somebody actually use the phrase plundering of the Egyptians in reference to this in medieval science, but, you know, what what is the good that was there? You know, I might have completely rejected at one point, but if I were to go back now, what's the, the gold amongst the dross? Um, but I do think the other is it's not inappropriate. It's not cheating or being less faithful or what have you to look at certain passages and go, it, it's not for me. You know, um, I, I think there's obviously there are core doctrines and teachings that we have. We articulate them in the creeds. Uh, those can often make us uncomfortable and we need to wrestle with them. But by the same token, I think um, there are plenty of other passages that are just, yeah, I mean, they're speaking to other people. They're literally speaking to a people of a different time with different concerns. And we don't have to, we don't have to belabor it in that sense. Um, but I do think there, I, the one thing I would encourage us all, and this is very much speaking to myself um, as I've been preparing for this, this, this class with you, um, is yeah, is to really wrestle with um, yeah about the notion of angels, about how big and broad this world is that is beyond this world, right? You know, um, I I tend to default to to Anne's position that if I'm going to go ahead and believe in these things, I can just let these others flow around me, kind of thing. Um, but it's been people like Elizabeth. I've never had a vision. I've never, well, I don't think I have. Others have suggested that some dreams that I've had that seemed incredibly vivid might well have been God trying to communicate, speak to me. But um, 
Elizabeth has had some pretty concrete experiences. Um, and I and I and and of course there are many other people. She happens to be somebody whose witness and testimony I trust. Um, anyway, let's let's press on then. Let's jump down to, to verse eight. Um, unless there are other comments. Now, here again, we're still in the Psalms. And um, well, if we were teaching Psalms, we would talk about these sorts of coronation hymns. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the righteous scepter is the scepter of your kingdom. There are those who will um, argue that, I mean, these are, these are enthronement hymns, and so they're describing God, but they're about the enthronement of the king, the human king, but he is a representative of God. And, and no doubt some of that element is true. Here it's being deployed to be applied to the Son. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. So you can see right in those two verses, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And then it says, you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you. Part of what, and this is, this is uh, kind of good midrash, um, Jewish exegesis, What's not explicated here, but implicit, there's a tension in these two verses in the psalm. The first verse seems to be directed at God, but then it continues with the same person, you. Now, but now it's saying, God, instead of you being God, you are the one who is being blessed by God, anointed by God. And, and again, part of what I think the, the author is trying to do here is it, we would talk about it as trying to address the Trinity and understand the relationship to the Father and the Son. And he is acknowledging, the author is acknowledging that the, the, the one anointed by God, the King in the past, but now the Son have that relationship. And then um, verse 10, we, we get um, moving into Psalm 102. In the beginning, Lord, you founded the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like clothing, like a cloak. You will roll them up and like clothing, they will be changed. But you are the same and your years will never end. Now, part of what is at play here is if you go and look at all of these passages, you get this language of eternity, of being enthroned forever. But there, as I suggested before, there's a really big problem with those promises if they solely apply to a son of David, a human heir to the throne, which is by this point, for over 500 years, there hasn't been a son of David sitting on the throne. So what do we make of these promises of the, of the eternal nature? And so, obviously, it... it I say, obviously, that was sort of sarcastic or in air quotes. I mean, you can look at the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is what they're beginning. Jews in this period, and you can look at other um, um, Second Temple literature, Jews are beginning to really wrestle with this and trying to understand. And basically, you know, so there's one easy camp, which is like, yeah, that was just all fluff. It wasn't to be taken literally. It was just, you know, God of Israel, King of Israel, that God's going to bless him and so on and so forth. But yeah, you know, kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall, but you go on. Um, but there were others who said, no, this is God's word. Therefore, it doesn't return void. So we must need to understand it in a different way. And the author here is in that vein of reimagining, re-understanding and interpreting those passages in light of this new revelation of the incarnation um, of Jesus. And so um, that's, that's what's at work. There is, there is literally centuries of, of, of wrestling on the part of Jews to try and understand how all of these things can still be operative, can still be true. And, and I often reflect on how many people looked at it and walked away. These folks remained. And so when Jesus came, it all sort of clicked. But not for everybody, or Hebrews, the author wouldn't need to write this, right? So 
this sort of section ends with this question, but to which of the angels has God ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are not all angels spirits in the divine service sent to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? So here's a different understanding of angel at play. The angel is the servant of God. The angels are the ones who run around. I mean, you know, Hasatan at the beginning of Job, Satan, he runs around the world doing God's bidding. He's an angel. He's a messenger of God. Messengers don't sit at the right hand of God. And go back. Whoops, sorry, I went back too far. And so go back to here. When he made purifications for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So, again, it's fundamental assertions, but he's trying to address certain questions that maybe we don't have, but others do, but that he is the son of God and sitting on that throne. So, any anything on wrapping up chapter one, thoughts? So, we're still very much in preamble, and... Um, this is the, the last slide I have today, so um, we may end a little bit early. We'll see how conversation goes. So we get um, the, uh, sort of a second restatement now. Therefore, we must pay greater attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. The author will come back to this. You know, I wish we could go on to deeper theological truths, he says at one point. But, you know, and I, I don't really have time to go back to all these other things. What is it, chapter six or seven? He says this. Um, this is, this sort of rhetoric, one of the things I think we'll find is, um, I, I think the author is writing to a congregation like us. People who have heard, they have committed. This is not something that's intended to convert somebody who doesn't believe in Jesus to convert but rather to be both encouraging and exhortative, to draw us back, to pay attention, to, to reassess. I you know every, every morning when I, when I say the creed, I, there's some portion that I'm constantly going, do I? I guess so, you know? Um, and I think Hebrews is trying to address that. Well, and Christian, like when we say the um, repentance of sins, you know, that line that um, I forgive people as they forgive me. Well, it goes through my mind all the time. Well, I really shouldn't say that out loud because I'm still having trouble with person X or something. So when I said that I'd accept it, I accept it with questioning that, see, what you hit right. upon since I missed the first class, I had to, I did some research myself and it was about, you know, the purpose of Hebrews was to encourage Christians to persevere in the face of persecution. It's a doctrine mm -hmm. of the of Christ. And he's, he's, he's talking, whoever wrote this is, is encouraging us. Um, and so, uh, I, I have taken this as a, you know, it is like encouraging me, but it's also like, you know, get with it here because this is not just a mention of it, it's an exhortation. You know, it's a strongly urging the people that are reading this or listening to it to move forward. And that's why I think it's so pretty. Mm. I think about how many people I uh, come across that uh, live their lives without any reference to God, without any thought about whether there's a creator or anything of that nature. And uh, this passage somehow speaks to that, you know, how can we escape? I mean, I'm not talking about what they're not going to escape from, I don't know, but how can we um, escape if we neglect so great a salvation? And I love the parts of the verses after that, that this salvation was declared through the Lord. It was attested by the persons who were present with him, the um, 
and uh, God added to the testimony by the signs and wonders and miracles and by the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I mean, all of those uh, matters that are clear throughout the gospel and the book of Acts and right up to the church uh, when we look around at each other uh, today, those all attest uh, to the great salvation. Amen. Mm -hmm. I, I appreciate all that you all are saying and agree. Um, you know, there's this this clause in two for if the angels, to, if the message declared to the angels was valid, um, I, angels or not, that that's the question we're asking ourselves, right? So if this is valid, if this is true, then it deserves, it requires our response, mm -hmm. and at some point. I mean, this again, this is this is written for us in the sense that we are all here. This is not, you know, we're not down, uh, not down on the market or whatever, you, um, or, you know, not, not not at the tailgate yesterday for the game. Great win. But uh, over Florida, long time coming. Um, but we're this author is talking to, to us who are here saying, you've heard this before. You've heard it before. Examine it again. And find in it, to Anne's point, right? This is we we did talk about this. I'm glad you reminded us of it, Anne. That this is designed to encourage us in a time when our faith may be flagging, when our commitment might be lacking in resolve. And verse two, for you know, every transgression or disobedience received a just penalty. If that happened, and here it's you know, Amy said she, you know, depending on what people are. Uh, we, we all have something, right? We all have something. I'm trying to remember what it was. There was, um, what was I reading or listening to? And I just, I remember it was in the office actually, um, because my, my executive assistant's husband is also a preacher. So we can have certain conversations I can't always have with necessarily other folks at the university. And, and, we both were commenting, we had both been on the same call whenever this was made. I wish I could remember the original context, but we both sort of said the same thing to us after, uh, to each other afterwards, like everybody's got something in their life, right? And yet it is all received. And this is where we're, we're going to have to wrestle with or, or just set aside and not examine, depending on which way we want to go, exactly what work has been done on the cross the result, though, is that we have been saved. So when he says every transgression or dis disobedience received a just penalty or, or payment, he's talking about what Jesus did. And if that's true, then how can we, how can we neglect this? Now, there's, there is this negative in here, and there, this is the bit that is... is um, for me, you know, different parts, different different folks struggle with. Um, there are a couple of moments when this author is it really lays on it, saying, "How can you possibly reject what what you've once received, right?" Um, but how can we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Well, I just come back to saying, "I'm I'm grateful and trust uh, and a just and merciful God, right? That I don't have to make the decision for any one of us." But I think the author's point is, is so much more that we've got to pay attention to it. We've all got something, and yet that's something Jesus took care of for us, if we will acknowledge that, if we will live in that salvation. And then I think these last two verses, to, to Anne's point, you know, it speaks to this broad testimony that, that comes through all these different voices and to and miracles and wonders and and testimony and um and to just listen to listen and receive again i think that's where where the author is trying to lead us into thank you amy so much be well Well, that's really uh, what I had for today. Any thoughts on this? And then we're gonna we, we will get into some more. If I'm going too slow, if you want to go bigger chunks, just tell me. We can do that. Oh, um, no, 
what we're doing it's is great. good, in my opinion. It's great. Yeah. Um, I think as a um, Christian, I need to remember to put. What? I, excuse me. I, I was just thinking. I think as a Christian, um, when I first you know examined what I believed as you know as you said you do too when you say the creed. Some things I just kind of put aside and said, well, think about that, you know, uh, I believe in God, I believe that Jesus is his son, so I'm just going to hold a couple of things and, and look at them as I go along. But I think it's, to me, it's part of being a Christian is doing this re-examination, looking at things at different angles, and I love what you've done is put put these version, verses down that, that uh, are the foundations of what this author of Hebrews is saying, or a possible uh, foundation for it. I think it's, it's fascinating. I, I like what we're doing. Well, I don't want to bore folks, so just, you know, let me know if we need to pick it up, or conversely, let's use, I'll, I need to add Amy to our email list, but, you know, um, feel free during the week, if there's something you're seeing in the chapter ahead, to highlight and to make sure we bring that to the conversation as well. Okay. Um, I, it is really, um, I've heard more than one person describe the role of the preacher. And I think we could say that the, the teacher is, um, is to be a translator. That at all times, the Bible, the gospel has to be reframed. Like I said, we already see Paul in Acts and Peter in Acts reframing to understand, to articulate in different places. And it's, it's you know, I, I may have mentioned that some of the, the, the worst advice for preaching I ever heard was preach the sermon that you want to hear. That way, at least one person in the congregation will be interested. Um, <laughs> but I, I think it's sort of the worst advice because my, my, I believe firmly that we're there, the preacher is there to preach God's word to the congregation. It's what the congregation needs to hear. But if we don't know one another well, but then again, you think, you know, if just Ann and I were sitting and getting to know each other day in, day out, or like with my wife and daughter, I still don't always know what it is that they need to hear. And that's why really, it's not just that the preacher needs to translate. It's that we all collectively need to be in there and say, okay, if I'm cool with angels, that's not, that's not bothering me. What is in here that's nagging at me? What's, what's drawing me into this? What's, what's, where, what itch do I have that, that is being scratched here? Um, and the job is not to bring more questions or concerns, but rather to exhort, to encourage, um, to hang in there. And there have been plenty of times over the years when um, I've had to follow my own advice to others, where um, I had a student um, not long ago in my office before COVID, but when I was here at Kentucky, found out I was, my background and everything else came in and just, just sort of laid this problem um, and said, I just can't, I, I don't know what the answer is. And I said, okay. And so what's the answer? I said, I don't know. Uh, and they said, well, how do you deal with it? And I said, I, I, I leave it open. We don't have to answer every question. We don't have to know it all in order to, to, to move ahead. Um, and sometimes but we, we need to keep yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Sometimes you look at things from other angles and it makes a different kind of sense. Or it makes a, a, a yeah. bit of sense. I'm yeah, sorry, sorry absolutely. Like yeah. All right. Well, um, this last image I really like. I was looking for angel imagery in particular. Um, I really need to find out more about this manuscript because um, it's in Hebrew. But, um, you know, the, certainly truly observant Orthodox Jews are not supposed to render images. But this is uh, Abraham, that's Abraham, and that's Isaac, and, and uh, Abe, uh, Daddy Abe is about to cut Isaac, and here's the angel staying his hand uh, and pointing to the bush, and if I could show you the rest of it, you'd see the ram stuck in the thicket. Um, so the role of angels, are, are they're there, um, and um, I don't know, it's... Um, 
uh, I reflect and think about those who have passed and gone on, Paul's language about the veil being thin, the biblical stories. Um, I'm a very much a product of the Enlightenment um, and this modern era. And so part of my prayers over the years has been to, to hold less tightly and to be more open to the mystical, shall we say. Still waiting. We'll see. <laughs> Christian. Thank you all. God's blessing be on you all. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.